On this episode of Money Matters with Jim Doyle, who gets what? Guests Alyssa Lockhart, Christine Lowe, and Brian Altwasser pick apart family estate planning. Plan more, worry less. This is Money Matters with Jim Doyle. Today, we're uncovering why estate planning with parents and their advisors making decisions behind closed doors may not serve the needs of all involved. From family dynamics to charitable giving and philanthropy, knowing what to share can be a challenge. What's sometimes forgotten, it's not just what you give, but how and why you give that matters to families. Our guests will be helping us tackle these tough issues. But first, I sent Paige to ask, do you believe wills should be kept secret? Should families talk about what's in the will? Definitely. I think that's what family is all about. It's about being transparent with each other. It's about putting everything on the table, uh, you know, whatever is there. And everybody needs to know it because hiding it doesn't make any sense because then you're not being family. It depends on the families, of course, because if, uh, if some families are... Um, kind of ripped apart by things like that. But having said that, I have talked to my, my, my own relatives about it, yes. I would say that it's better to discuss on the proceedings, mean, meaning like where is the will, who's the lawyer they need to speak to, and everything. But the actual contents of the will itself, that's an iffy question. A um, lot of times parents are not fair. People tend to pick their favorites for whatever reason. And if you're doing that, I don't think those things should come out before the person has already passed away. We develop a lot of these long-term relationships with uh, uh, individuals and families, and it gives us some wonderful insights in what's going on. Now, often we see in an effort to be fair or to avoid conflict that people lose sight of their own wishes. What do you think of that? Do you see that in your practice? I absolutely do, and I think that with each of these comments we've just seen, they are bringing things to the table that we hear. Transparency. I don't think that transparency means telling your children what is in your will, just like the last commentator. I think there, we want our children to always know what our value system is, what we believe is important, and what to expect fundamentally when we pass on, not necessarily the provisions of the will. Now, Christian, I'm gonna hit you with a tough one here. Okay. This is often where we see a lot of family secrets coming out. So yes and no. I, you know, there's a saying that it's better to deliver your wishes with a warm hand rather than a cold one. So oftentimes while you're alive versus after you've passed. Um, and it depends on each client's comfort level and sharing that information, but I, where possible, I think it's a good idea to share where you're going, not necessarily the exact details in the will. Well, when we see secrets come out after death, the first argument your children have is the first one you can't help them resolve. Can't help them resolve. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we do our best. You know, the benefits of having an outside advisor, whether it's a financial advisor, a lawyer, or an accountant, is that they can try and be an impartial third party. Um, you know, the client has set what they want, uh, and it's our job to try and help the family members follow along to see what was the roadmap that they laid out. In my planning practice, we often provide talking points that people can take to the lawyer to make the process easier. We'll be right back. Philanthropic planning is, is something that can go off the rails very easily. Welcome back. In this segment, we're talking about taking a leadership role in your estate planning and getting your family involved in your charitable giving strategies. Christine, what happens in your world? So in our world, we often see, you know, perhaps a set of parents that have a vision, perhaps whether it's for charity or they have a vision for what they want their kids to do. But I always tell our clients, it's not just about making beneficiaries, but making stewards having your clients or you're having your children understand what it means to steward that wealth, whether it's for charitable intentions or their families and generations down the road. Now, having a steward, passing the baton, what do you see? 
I see in the first generation very good pr transfer of value systems into the second generation. Our generation is not engaging our children as well as our parents did in taking us out and showing us what do we value about community sponsorship, community building. So Christine, where do you think some of that leadership should come from? It really could come from any level. Oftentimes we do see it from the parents wanting to share their vision for giving back to the community with their kids. Sometimes we even see a reverse of the kids saying, hey parents, I'd, I'd like to do this, we'd like to give, how can, how can I do that? I met up with Brian Altwasser, UBC Gift and Estate Planning, to share his insights on charitable giving. So what does leadership within the family look like when we talk about philanthropic planning? Well, it's, in many cases, it's quite basic. It's really just that individual in the family who perhaps has a leadership role in other matters, who wishes to now sort of pursue estate planning, which at maybe perhaps in their stage in their life is more important now and needs to be dealt with. Now, we talk about leadership in philanthropic planning. Why is that so essential? Because philanthropic planning is, is something that can go off the rails very easily. So the leadership is very important just to, to direct people um, and to get them sort of on the same page in terms of their philanthropic wishes. Now, if the kids haven't been brought up in this, uh, how much of a learning curve is it for them to take over? For some kids, it can be quite a learning curve. Um, what some parents do is they involve their children in sort of their philanthropic giving from a very young age. They become aware that mom and dad go to the hospital every perhaps three to four months to see what their, their gifts are doing. What a wonderful idea of leadership, teaching your kids early, getting them involved. Definitely. Is it common for parents to bring their kids into their charitable giving discussions, or for that matter, there were estate planning discussions. So more often I do see that our clients who are parents are bringing their kids into the charitable giving conversation, less so on the estate planning conversation. Uh, the reason being is they do view their estate planning as something that's private. Um, that being said, it is their children's legacy. So I do think it's important that they have both discussions. Now, Alyssa, are you seeing the same things in your practice? Absolutely, but I deal with a lot of people who are multi-generational business owners and their children are already involved in management of their assets during so, their lifetime. So they've been involved since a young age? From a very young age usually. But I think that outside of those families, it is still considered private territory. Well, when do you think people should start getting involved with this sort of discussion? So from a, a parent point of view or a gifter point of view, I think the earlier you can have that conversation, the better. I still think it's a great idea to have a broad level roadmap versus they don't need to know the exact specifics of what's happening in your estate plan. These discussions are just so important. Let's go back to Paige as she asked, is it a tradition in your family to talk about estate planning? When you were growing up, did your families bring you into the estate planning discussions? No. Oh gosh, there was no, we were brought up like we're living now. <laughs> My family did, did involve me. I mean, it's not like they involved me in every step of the process, but there was times when, uh, there was a time when we made a decision to sell one of our inherited houses. And Dad spoke to all the three brothers, make sure we were okay because it's, it would have come to us. And so things like that we did speak, but not every nut and bolt and of a detail in that. It was very apparent and clear that my parents have made uh, their investments in our education and our future. And then uh, once we go out in the world and earn our living, then we have to support them. Uh, and, 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 and that's how we learned. We learned by observing them, the, how they led their lives and, and how prudent they were with money and tried to imbibe the same in our lifestyle. Blended families, uh, family businesses, and charitable planning are three areas that can benefit from family input. Why is it so important that we get proper advice when it comes to modern family estate planning? So it's, it's very important to have an advisor involved where possible, whether it's your financial advisor, your lawyer, your accountant. Um, they're able to bring an outside perspective to what sometimes can be a very emotional matter. Now speaking of muddying things, let's talk about blended families. Does that create challenges? Blended families face different legal obligations in their estate planning. And people who are in blended families, which means 
you have children with your former spouse and maybe with your current spouse, those people have different legal obligations? Well, listen, we've only just scratched the surface here. When we come back, we're going to be talking about those procrastinators out there. You know who you are. You're basically talking about death and your pain is still alive and in front of you or your uncle or grandmother. Welcome back. Earlier in the show, we mentioned it's just not what you give, but how and why you give that matters to families. I'd love to get your thoughts on that, Alyssa. When we share a value system with our children from an early age, they can really appreciate what we've given and how we've given it after we pass away. But when we overlook explaining to them the underpinnings of our decision making, then they really are left without the roadmap you mentioned earlier. Now, Christine, I want to talk about giving unequally in a will and how that's a problem. So it's an issue, of course, just from an emotional point of view. You know, one child might say, did I do something wrong? You know, my parent doesn't love me as much. But it could be perhaps that the other child was working in the business with the parent and a lot of the value that they've seen in the personal wealth came from that business endeavor. There's different ways to accomplish uh, what the parent might view as fair in trying to compensate the child who worked in the business versus the one that didn't. Let's go back to Paige for some additional perspectives on these sensitive family issues. Why do you think it's difficult for families to talk openly about wills and estate planning? For me, it becomes a bit sensitive from two angles. First, you're basically talking about death and your pain is still alive and in front of you or your uncle or grandmother. Uh, if you're going to see a bias um, coming from, from your folks towards, um, you know, towards you or the rest of the family, um, and them, them might cause issues. I think trust is one thing. Uh, sometimes this can also be emotional decision. So it's hard to get the fish on the table uh, and get everybody to talk about it. So I think these two things. Your kids don't really talk about you dying. They want to see you living. So um, while we're still walking, we're going to be traveling and spending their inheritance. As long as you bring a souvenir back. <laughs> <laughs> or a t-shirt. As a financial planner, part of our annual review is checking to see whether your will is up to date. People can be such phenomenal procrastinators when it comes to this stuff. So what advice would you offer for getting the most out of these family estate planning discussions? I think people need to recognize that none of us make good decisions in a vacuum. And I think that when we engage the entire family in discussing what we want to see happen, how we want to see it happen, both before we pass away and after we pass away, then when you come to the table with your advisors, your legal advisors, you're going to get so much more out of the experience. Now, Christine, what are the chances are if someone's putting this stuff off that there's some other undisclosed issues that haven't been addressed? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think that's a very high chance. If somebody's putting off wanting to talk about the scary parts, death, incapacity, it's most likely that there are other issues that they might not be talking about yet because they haven't yet reached the thoughts of what happens when I'm not here or I'm not able to help my family members in their decision making. Now we sometimes see shareholders agreements that have been really old and don't get done. Again, are we looking for signs that maybe there's other problems? Yes, if people can't come to the table, it's probably because someone won't come to the table. For too many families, that table is just too far away. Let's go back to Brian to learn more about developing trends in charitable giving. So what sort of changes are you seeing these days with regards to charitable giving? Well, one major change is just the fact that donors can give a variety of instruments now to a charity, you know, such as securities, insurance policies, RSPs. They, they can even set up trusts if they want to. So there's a wide variety of options for charitable giving. Now, do families want more of a say these days with regards to how their donations are being used? Well, that's a definite trend. I mean, with the baby boomer generation, I would say there's much more of an interest in knowing how the funds are being used and actually and being informed about how these funds are also being used. 
Now what happens if for an individual who maybe has no heirs or beneficiaries but wants to live off of the income of a future donation? Can you help them? Definitely. There's a variety of options that we can help the donor with, such as a charitable remainder trust where the donor would live off the income of the trust during their lifetime, but at the same time it would be clear that the assets of the estate are going to the charity upon the donor's passing. Sounds like it makes things simpler with some planning ahead of time. Definitely. In my practice, advisor-led discussions on charitable giving typically produce better engagement between all members of the family. Now, Christine, what other elements should we be bringing into this conversation? So, as Alyssa was saying earlier, it's sometimes even difficult to get the family members to the table to discuss. So sometimes having that discussion not at the dinner table, but at an advisor's office or something, some outside neutral third party area, it can help provide the right environment to have a discussion to figure out what the family vision is. Now Alyssa, I know you're a big fan of family led discussions, okay? How do you help them go down that path? Well, as a lawyer, traditionally, we're not able to speak with more than one party at one time. There are ways that we can engage with the, the second generation. And in that respect, what we're trying to do, once we sort that out and get in the room, we're trying to get to the underlying emotional issues. People wear different hats in the family. They wear different hats when it comes to advising mom and dad. They wear different hats when it comes to working in the family business and working with the charitable organizations that the family's involved with. And we need to identify their different roles before we can help them have that open conversation. Alyssa mentioned something earlier when we were talking in that it should be situationally appropriate. You need to make sure you have the right conversation at the right time. I know a lot of problems just surface themselves and then you play a game of whack-a-mole. Is that <laughs> typical of family businesses? It can be, it can be, absolutely. But when we're doing that, we have to figure a way to get out in front of it. From a strategic perspective, this is where we want to lead. Listen, I love that you're going down this leadership role because I think it's so important. We'll be right back. Charitable giving is really a noble gift to the world, but it's something that needs to be implemented properly and correctly. it's time to hear our panel's final thoughts. Christine? When taking a leadership role, I think it's really important to think about have you got your estate planning done? Whether you've done it before or this is your first time, there's a few milestones you can think about. We like to call it the hatches, matches, dispatches, and Americans. So the hatches part is have there been any new births? Grandchildren, children, matches, any new marriages, cohabitations, people living together, Dispatches, divorces, separation, someone's passed away. Or Americans, I couldn't find one that rhymes, uh, but essentially if anyone does move south of the border, you have some unique tax problems there that have to be taken to, into account. If you had one last tip, what would it be? I said earlier that your message is better shared with a warm hand rather than a cold one. So as much as possible, if you can have your conversations while you're alive, rather than having your kids find out through your will after you've passed away, that would be the gold standard. Christina, I loved your tips there. I wish I'd written them down. Let's go to Brian for his final thoughts. I guess my final thoughts would be that charitable giving is really a noble gift to the world. But it's something that needs to be implemented properly and correctly. So my final thoughts go beyond just sort of the leadership component of charitable giving and are just advice to people that it's really a great idea if you are interested in charitable giving to talk to your professional advisor about it, to talk to the charity that perhaps you're interested in. The charity will probably have a group of people there who would be more than willing to speak to you. It's really important to go the extra mile to ensure that your plans for charitable giving for the future are implemented according to your wishes. You mentioned the importance of bringing your family into these discussions. Why is that so integral? You want to make sure that the family is on board with the general plans that you've envisioned. Just in general, for any sort of major decision that involves a family, it's a great idea just to have everybody on board. Now, if I put my charitable plan together 10 years ago, should I go back and review it regularly with somebody like yourself? 
Oh, I would definitely recommend that at least every five years, just to make sure that what you had envisioned is still possible and that are there any sort of improvements that could be done to, to make your plan even better. Well, listen, I like the idea of legacy that survived beyond you. What a wonderful idea. It's a great idea. I, I personally like it a lot. Now, listen, I just loved Brian's suggestion, bring the family in it. What sort of words of wisdom do you have for us? Well, I think that it's very important, as I said earlier, that transparency be a big part of how a family operates in the estate planning realm. When we give one child one asset that might pass non-taxable and another child the other asset that is depleted by a tax obligation, because we didn't understand how our estate assets would be treated after our death, then we haven't actually accomplished the goals we set out to. So it's very important to be transparent with our children, but also with our advisors. As we've heard today, estate planning is so much more than who gets your stuff. So what's my final thought on today's subject? People rarely consider the legacy their estate planning wishes create for their families. For a better outcome, talk to your family so they understand why you've made the decisions you've made and what your wishes really are. For more ideas, follow me on Twitter at jdoyle, Vancouver. I want to thank Christine, Brian, and Alyssa for sharing your thoughts today on Money Matters. Because financial aspects touch so many elements of our lives, it pays to get great advice. Plan more, worry less.